So one of the things, if you're listening, that I always, you know, kind of scratch my head about is like, you know, what the hell is social selling, right? And if you're listening to this and you've ever wondered, you know, what is social selling? Should I be doing it? Is there a good way to do this? Is there a bad way? Uh, we're going to get into that today. But if this is your first time checking out the podcast, my name is Jason Bay. Welcome to Blissful Prospecting. And in this podcast, I try to really dissect what top reps, sales leaders, other experts are doing so I can teach you how to turn complete strangers into paying customers. So today we're talking about social selling and our guest is Alex Boyd, founder and CEO at Revenue Zen. And we're going to talk about what social selling is, misconceptions about it, principles of great social selling. And he's going to share some really cool how-to tactics and strategies. He's also got a cool course that he just came out with that he's going to tell us about. But uh, Alex, good to have you on the show. Thanks. It's good to be here, my friend. Yeah, it's good to chat. I, uh, we met, dude, we met back in, I think it was either 2017 or early part of 2018, maybe, but I was sort of just getting started with blissful prospecting and you were like, had some really good advice around tools and, and like data and all this other stuff that I should check out. So that was pretty interesting, but yeah. so Tell, tell us about Revenue Zen. How has Revenue Zen changed? I know your guys' business has really changed in the last five years. What, do you, what are you guys up to? How have things been changing? Yeah, it has. Um, uh, I think this because the story of how we started was so um, awkward and it was not this intentional, like, I have a business plan. We're going to do this. It was just like I left my job as a head of growth. Another opportunity I had to become a partner in someone else's business fell through. And... I had friends that were in tech who was just like, can you help us fractionally and consult? And I was like, yeah, sure. So we were, we were doing a lot of different stuff early on with just me and then my other co-founder and then my third uh, partner um, around training and coaching and running some outbound stuff and developing content. Um, and a lot of the early business we were doing was around outsourcing lead gen because at the time there was a tactic you could run, um, which we both know, which was you know, employed more automation tactics in it and it was effective then. Um, and so um, that business line took off, but uh, we we really found our, our North Star a couple of years in, about a year and a half in, in inbound marketing, um, which included a lot of stuff that I knew from what I was doing on social, which is where marketing and selling meets, I think, where you have personal LinkedIn profiles, people, AEs who are generating tons of leads through LinkedIn. Um, so today, we see ourselves as becoming the growth hub for, you can learn how to do this, you can hire us for services, you can buy our tools, you can get referrals, you can access our knowledge in a bunch of different ways. So that's more what our vision is, um, even though most of what our revenue comes from today is selling B2B inbound marketing and content marketing uh, work. Um, so I, I have been one of the main quote unquote salespeople throughout the whole time as a CEO, you're always selling. So I've stayed in the mm -hmm. trenches that way. And here we are today, five and change years in and having a blast. So how did you learn about, like when did the term social selling first come across like into your radar, I guess? And what did you what did you think of this? When, how, when did this journey start for you? Funny, like I never heard the term until someone coined it. Um, I was just sort of doing it. Like the first time this happened was, um, I had started a post on LinkedIn because of a comment my my VP had made when I was at my last job. And he was like, yeah, they're really talking about what you did with the outbound team and the, the, some of the boardrooms around town. And I was like, what? Really? And I was like mid-20s, like who, who cares or knows what I'm doing? But it, it sort of hit me that um, what I was doing could have impact elsewhere. So I started posting on Modern Sales Pros. I posted on LinkedIn just to sort of test my ideas and kind of see how much I knew and whether my ideas were any good. And then a couple of months in, I got an email from someone that said, hey, we haven't met up in a couple of years, but I saw your post in my feed come up on LinkedIn and we're building out our, our sales team. Um, uh, can we talk? And it turned into a 200 plus thousand a year engagement. Um, and so it actually wasn't until a bit later that I really connected the dots and thought, wait a minute, this is something I need to do as a system because it is working and I'm attributing revenue to it very directly. And this like, you have the email where they say, I saw you post on LinkedIn, I would like to work with you. And then you get an agreement signed. Like it's just so clear. 
And then the term social selling came in, I don't know, someone clever, more clever than me coined it later. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's what I do. Um, but um, it was just this process that I hadn't really defined, just became a habit. Like the habit was every week I post something on LinkedIn, maybe once, a, once or twice a week about the journey, what's going on, my viewpoints, what our customers are doing, stuff that I think is funny, something is interesting. Um, and I would connect with people. I would chat them up. I would just sort of send messages that weren't prospecting because I don't, I don't like, you know, cold calls, to be honest. I've made a lot of them, but I don't really like them. Yeah. So I would send messages that weren't, that didn't feel like cold calls. And now, interestingly, that's a great way to do outbound, right? Is things that don't feel like outbound. But um, that was the journey to today. Um, so even though we are mostly an SEO agency, um, I get plenty of leads for SEO services from posting about that on my LinkedIn profile. So it worked really well for sales. Yeah. It's so crazy because in the five, six year span, you made a very drastic, like, Hey, we're an agency that does outbound for people an outsourced SDR agency to like doing full on inbound. What are your thoughts? I have to get your hot take on, on outbound. What do you think about outbound now? And what do you see the future of, of outbound being. I love this. Um, well, I remember a time at my last company where the CEO got back from lunch with a CEO friend of hers and she was like, all right, so we're going to build an office of 60 SDRs in the next few months. Should we put them in Arizona or Denver? And I was like, whoa, hold the phone. We have five SDRs. What are you talking about? St start over. Like this is not happening. None of this is happening. Um, because at the time, think back, right? You have the Zenefits model, more bodies, more templates being sent, more of the same thing, scale it up, right? And you got to hand it then, like from Salesforce on, that model worked, right? The problem was that everyone got used to it. And when, when people get used to anything, they stop paying attention. So um, the bar got raised. And suddenly, I think I think today, where we are is you can't just template your stuff and expect to get any results from it. You got to actually add what Sam McKenna might call show me, you know me, right? Or um, the use the reply method that you have to actually get results from it. So the bar keeps going up to stand out. And what buyers are doing is they're just mentally and physically from their inboxes filtering out stuff and from their phones. Like if if you're an SDR team and your, your caller ID shows up as spam likely, like good luck, right? <laughs> um, so... Yeah. I think that there's going to be fewer bodies doing outbound and more resources behind it. And there's going to be fewer like carbon copy SDRs and more, um, more SDRs going into content roles, more SDRs going into ops roles, more SDRs going into like specialty community management roles, um, more people that are just focused on product knowledge being distributed in forums and on LinkedIn. And you're going to have less of this like, this is a dialer bot person, right? And like some dialer bots, to be honest, but then you're going to have a lot of these like more varied demand generals that are going to sit under VP of, VP of marketing rather than VP of sales. Um, that really should be where the industry goes, ideally. Um, so it's not the death, the death of the SDR. It's just that that should no longer be the default choice. Um, and people are starting to really get that, which I love. Yeah. Okay. So you're a fan of having this roll up to to marketing, which from what it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, I, people ask me this all the time because I work with companies and it, I've seen both scenarios work very well, but I, I usually see it work better under marketing. And the reason for that is that because it rolls up to marketing, um, there's so much more alignment with the, like the lead gen and demand gen function where all of the content that they create is in alignment with the people that they're going to be doing outbound to. And they talk really closely around what are some of the problems, challenges, things that we hear our prospects say to us over the phone and respond back with emails. And let's create content for that. Let's create a case study. Let's create a webinar and invite some of these people on to talk about it. Is that sort of your thinking, you know, as well, you care to elaborate? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and to be clear, I'm not like a, I'm not saying that if your SDR team reports to VP of sales is going to fail, not at all. But uh, I think if you're talking about the future, it's going to be more like diverse roles and some sitting under sales, some sitting under marketing, and it'd be kind of like expansion of the role more than it will be just proliferation of the number of them. Um, but yeah, you hit the nail on the head. The thing that you can 
do well with outbound as with marketing is to really nail the specific problem somebody has, right? So if someone was prospecting revenues and, you know, four years ago, they might've been like, Hey, you know, that system you have where you post job posts for writers and it's a pain in the ass to filter through all those. Um, and you just wish there was an easy way to hire writers for your clients, with the right expertise. Um, if that's the case, we may have a solution for you. Like I would be like, okay, I'll bite. Cause you named the problem I have very specifically using words that I would use. Um, yeah. and I, I think we all see the same thing today with CTA differentiation. So like, I'm not going to give you 15 minutes of my time until you've shown value upfront. So like value up front, show you understand my world, that bar goes up a lot. Um, so yeah, like I was being prospected by a tech company the other day and she was like, well, um, let's jump on a call. And I was like, no, can you send me stuff up front to make sure it's a good fit? And she was like, absolutely. Send me like three pages of shit that had nothing to do with my business. And I was like, okay, well, I don't want to jump on a call because none of that is relevant to my priorities that I told you what they are. Um, she was like, well, if I had just been able to do discovery, I would have been able to create a good thing. And I was like, you're not understanding me. Like, I'm not going to let you do discovery because you've shown me that it's probably going to be a waste of my time by what you've said. Yeah. So you have to nail that upfront message or why the hell am I going to give you half an hour? Yeah. Which, which we got to remember half an hour on a meeting is a mental hour, right? Cause it interrupts all their flow. So when you're asking 15 minutes, you're actually asking for a focus break for an hour, which costs an executive a lot of money. So value up front, use words they use, and whether it's marketing or sales that knows that stuff, whoever is talking to prospects and customers, picking out the words they use in the way that they say it, right? Like, and Matt, I used to tell the people this when I was um, running SDR campaigns, is imagine you are around the bar or a fireplace with your prospects. How are they talking? They're probably not using the same words that your blog posts use, unless your marketing team is damn good. So use the words that they use, um, like use the jargon that they use. I'm a fan of using jargon if you know what it means, right? Don't use jargon, you don't know what it means, but if you, if you know the hell out of what it means, absolutely use it because you sound like an expert right away, you know? Yeah. I love that we're talking about this because what you just mentioned is sort of the, these, this is a universal fundamental that applies across anything that I involves acquiring clients marketing, demand mm -hmm. gen, uh, selling, prospecting, creating content, whatever it is, all of that fundamentally revolves around knowing your customer's problems, their language, all that kind of stuff. I, I love that. How do you capture that? What, are, what techniques do you, do you interview customers? Do you go back through recordings? Like how do you get these specific problems, learn their language, and then incorporate that? Like what, how do you capture that? and store it. Yeah. One of the, um, you have to be, you have to capture in an environment where there is trust. Um, so a very formal interview may not give you what you want. Um, if you sit a customer down in front of a, a couple cameras and a producer and somebody holding a notepad, they're probably going to actually speak in ways that are much more formal than you might want. So, um, one example is join a forum where your prospects talk to each other. So if you yeah. sell to the RevOps team, um, join Modern Sales Pros and just look, just watch how people talk to each other. Um, not to you, but to each other. You can get it from how they talk to you, but you have to be judicious, right? P pull your call recordings, look at the transcripts, look how they phrase it when they're like really getting out the problem. Um, so for my industry, for example, people will be like, yeah, I feel like my current SEO agency just doesn't understand growth. They just like optimize meta tags and call it a day. And, uh, you know, we want somebody who's going to actually help us move up the rankings. And so I've been like, yeah, like you don't want someone to just change some H ones and call it a day. Right. Like, and I just use those same words and they're like, yeah, totally. You guys get it. You're growth oriented. These people are just, you know, um, twiddling their thumbs behind the screen and charging me a bunch of money for it. They don't even know what they're doing. Um, so um, I would, you, ha you can't listen to like the very formal version. Um, you got to hear it when they're um, describing it as they would to someone they're close with. So forums, trade shows, anywhere where they're talking to each other, that's the best. Um, when they're talking to you, you can get it from there. So you got to be a little more judicious. You can't just ask him simple questions. You actually have to be good at discovery um, if you're in marketing yeah. and trying to get 
customer information. Because if you ask a silly question, you're going to get a silly answer and it's not going to help you at all, right? Like, what keeps you up at night? Like, yeah. <laughs> come on. Like, that doesn't, doesn't help me at all, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But you, you're going to have to ask a question that stands on the shoulders of what you already know. So discovery skills make you a great marketer. That's why I think more SDR should go into marketing. Yeah. No, I love this. Another, I love the join a forum. The, uh, just listening back to a gong or chorus, you know, recording uh, of someone doing great discovery can be super beneficial too. And um, like with the people I sell to these VPs of sales, what I always hear them talk about is like two things. It's pull through of training. So they train their reps and they have this enabled team, but they don't have any way of reinforcing it. And people don't take anything away from those formalized, you know, kind of trainings. And then the other thing I hear too is like getting their AEs. They use the term self-source a lot. How do we get them to self-source their pipeline more and not rely so much on the SDR yeah. team? You just don't, you don't get that from like, you have to talk to these people or find out, like you said, how they talk to each other. And once you get those things, it makes social selling, you know, for example, so much easier because that's a content piece, mm -hmm. you know, that you can write. But let's, let's talk about social selling. So what are some of the misconceptions that people have about what social selling is? I think there's a big one that MarTech companies have reinforced, which is that social selling is about the sales team being kind of the cattle of the marketing team where every sales rep's profile is a place for marketing to say, 200 of y'all better post this blog post I wrote because I want you to. So I'm gonna beam it out to all your profiles through my platform. And the sales reps are like, all right, this is dumb, but whatever, I'll do it just because I'm taking a salary and you can tell me what to do. So great. But then the rep doesn't get any personal benefit whatsoever, right? And their prospects look at this and I'm like, all right, you're a rep that shared marketing's content. Big whoop. Like I don't, doesn't make you seem like an expert. Whereas um, somebody who posts original content does way, way better, right? Because then it's, I'm looking at their own content, not content they borrowed from someone else. And I can conclude if that content is good. If all you do is share someone else's content, how is anyone going to know if you're any good? You could be the most knowledgeable industry expert in the world with 10 years of experience doing telecommunications. But if all you do is share someone else's content, how are they going to know that you're worth talking to? And a discovery call is much, much warmer. If somebody has been, and I quote, as I always get, following you for months, reading your stuff on LinkedIn for a year now. Like I get this all the time, way warmer of a call. Yep. And I'm not just talking about warmth in a, you know, a woo woo way. My win rates show for it. A win rate on uh, prospects sourced from my LinkedIn posts is 59%. It's way higher than any other source, even referrals. So, yeah. you know, you can measure this in CRM, right? You can, uh, there are tools like ours, you can, I guess ours is the only one, you can plug in to actually get, hey, this prospect viewed your profile. Hey, you exchanged messages with this prospect on LinkedIn. They commented on your post, you comment on their post, then the op was created, right? So you, normally you'd have to just tell your manager, oh yeah, I was I was doing stuff on LinkedIn. Like, don't worry, it'll create pipeline. Um, and for reps, that's often they're left alone. And people like, you know, Sarah Bazir at Gong has done exactly that with just like, undeniable quota production from the social selling work. And she ain't sharing no company blog posts. So that's the first thing is you got to take ownership of your profile. You want prospects to look at you as an expert, cut down on sharing other people's stuff, write your own stuff. And then people think, okay, I want to do that, but what do I know? And I'm like, you talk to how many prospects every week? You know yeah. way more than you think you do, right? Like you talk to more people in your um, your industry than they do, because if you're if you sell to you know CIO, you almost certainly talk to more CIOs than, than each CIO does, unless they're like a very very networking friendly CIO. Um, but you probably know more about that than they do, so so share that. And then people say, okay, all right, what if I share? But I don't want to name names. I'm not allowed to. Okay, take the names off, right? You know, use the you know the CTO of a a footwear company said the other day, I mean, just obscure it somehow. But but you got to tell stories about two things. One, your own credibility. How have you helped people get 
done, something that they need to get done as a big part of their job. Um, and once you've demonstrated your credibility, you got to highlight customer results and go in and actually say, even with the names removed, we worked with this kind of company. They were trying to do this. They were experiencing this. I introduced, you know, some sort of perspective reframe or a new way of thinking about it after implementing our product. And here they are crushing it, right? So you're, you, you highlight a customer result. You, you write a case study basically on LinkedIn, making them the hero, the customer, and you are the supporting character. You're this like secret weapon they put on. You're a power up. Um, you do that enough times and, and prospects are going to be like, all right, I'll bite. Looks like you helped me do this. And I believe you now because it's been three months of me reading your stuff. So, and then they'll DM you. Or if you're a smaller company, they'll go to your website and they'll say, I saw so-and-so on LinkedIn. I want to talk to sales. Um, so that's how, that's the misconception in order is like, I need to get beyond sharing marketing content. I need to share my own content. Uh, I want to anonymize names so I'm not breaking privacy. And then four, I want to do it in such a way that makes the prospect the hero, not the sales rep. If you do those, yeah, I'm knocking out of the park. Okay, let's talk about the the content piece. So, because you sort of nailed it there, where you're like, you know, what do I know? Is what a lot of people think, you know. And I was working yeah. with a client the other day, and they sell into you know K through twelve, and I was like how many principals have you guys talked to this year? And they're like 60. I was like, how many principals do you think the principal you're reaching out to has talked to? Maybe two, three other principals. I was like, you yeah. know more than this dude does. Okay. You do. Yeah. Right? You talk to way more principals than they do. Um, so I love what you said there. So can you talk about, you know, kind of the voice, I guess, that you're using? And what I mean by that is, do you have to talk like you are the expert? Or is there more of a stance here you can take where I'm sharing what I hear from other people? I'm sharing how we help them, not how like, you know, I'm not like up on this pedestal, so to speak, like speaking down at these people saying, you should do it this way. Here's how, like, can you talk a little bit more about maybe the, the kind of voice that you're writing this in? Yeah, um, that should be authentic to you. And what I mean by that is, how do you normally talk? Um, because you can demonstrate your credibility in a number of ways, right? Like we find um, uh, Richard Branson credible in a different way than we find like, um, you know, an elder statesman credible. They just speak in different ways, right? Um, yeah. And like Elon Musk can be credible about certain things and not about others. Um, but everyone can talk in their own their own voice, I think. Um, and yeah, I definitely hear people not wanting to be seen as talking down. And my response is like, yeah, so don't, you know, like just put it, just speak from what my philosophy professor used to call the point of view of the universe. Um, what, what happened? Mm. You can just document what happened um, and whose role was what. So I recommend not putting your, you yourself in this sort of braggy pedestal way, right? So if you worked as part of a team to make an implementation of a two million a year enterprise product go well, just say that, right? Like, and whatever your role, role was, say that. If, if your job was to make sure that a critical piece of info got passed to CS at the right time, which enabled a board report to go way smoother, awesome, right? Um, so if, if it, but if it was you, right, if you're a consultant or you're a seller who is selling more of themselves, then that's more accurate to be more, more um, emphasizing your own contribution. Um, just tell the story, whatever the true story is. It can be, you know, whatever your role, but maybe your role was only to start the discussion, but you found the right way in, which was a value to the prospect or the, the customer. Um, and yeah, if you, um, I would recommend not going full timid, right? You're going to want to make sure to kind of lionize your customer, but don't lionize yeah. yourself quite as much. Um, what I, one thing I love is to talk your team up a lot, like really give props yeah. to your product team, your CS team, like hats off to them for building such, such cool stuff. Um, as customer just joined 60 days in, here's what they're seeing post implementation. The VP of, of technology said this, Pumped to see this, happy I could play a small role, right? Lionize your customer, your team, give credit to others. 
funny thing about when you do that, people are going to assume you had a bigger role than you did. And who needs to correct anybody? But I, I'm a fan of giving credit um, to others as much as possible, especially to your customers first and your team second. In nowhere in that process do you need to brag, right? You can, you should and can do this whole thing without bragging. Yeah. No, I love that because it's a totally different way of, you know, kind of thinking about it and, um, you know, this making your customer the hero. You know, I love that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if someone's getting started with social selling, what are, like, what's a tangible goal that someone might have coming into this? Because that's the part I think that people measure the wrong stuff typically. They measure likes and comments yeah. usually when they start creating content. That's where most people are just like, oh my God, I spent an hour writing a post and it only got viewed 50 times. You know, um, like when you're setting expectations with the people that you work with, um, what kind of goals should someone have, you know, kind of coming into starting, you know, this social selling journey? I think likes and comments are okay as long as you look at it as likes and comments from the people in my industry. Um, mm -hmm. So if your content is getting viewed or engaged with by people that are prospects or others that also sell to the same market as you do, that's a good thing. Um, and I'm, I'm not a fan of paying attention just to the vanity metrics, right? Because like you can post absolute, you know, lunatic content that gets a lot of engagement you can buy followers, you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, but the goal should be to have people learn something new. Like if just one prospect who is a decision maker and fits your ICP, if they think, huh, I learned something new and they tell you, yeah, I learned something from that post or they comment like, this is good information. I hadn't thought about it that way. You want to cause an aha moment in at least one person when you post. Um, it can be they were inspired or educated, they learned something, but um, that's pulled straight out of the challenger sale, by the way, is just create that aha moment and share some new insight and perspective. It can be one person's day you changed, it can be one new insight, but that's what you wanna go for. Um, and really can't get discouraged if you don't nail it on the first try. You're, you're gonna get like two or five likes on your first try, that's all right. Um, so be consistent. Um, just like when you're making cold calls, right? You wouldn't make five cold calls and put the phone down. So be consistent. Um, and when you, when you say sales is a numbers game, put that into content too. It's the same idea. You do have to show up week in, week out for people to think this person is not going anywhere. Um, cause you're not going to nail it on the first try. It's not how marketing works, not how sales works. Um, if you do, you're just lucky, right? If you make your first cold call of the day and turns yeah. it into an op, you're just lucky, you know? Um, but that's not how we would look at cold calling, nor would we look at content creation. So keep it up. How long have you been posting on LinkedIn? Maybe four and a half, five years. I guess right when I started, but um, it's kicked in within three months and it's just been consistently a third of our cash flow yeah. since the beginning. So like 2017-ish? Yeah, 2017, and it was the summer of 2017 yeah. um, when I got my first like six-figure deal from it. Um, and it's, like I said, just been consistent from there since. Yeah, I love that, dude. I, I think that when people, something that people don't think about, that's right around the time when I started posting too. It took me much longer mm -hmm. <laughs> than you <laughs> to get decent at it. But if you look at the content we post now and the type of engagement it gets, like, Dude, that's like five plus years of work of, I don't know how often you post, but for the, since the beginning of 2020, I've been posting every weekday on LinkedIn outside of a vacation what? or a national holiday every day, every weekday. Yeah. So, um, and it was seven times a week for a while that I dialed it back, but, um, yeah, wow. every weekday barring a week vacation, if I take it or a national holiday and, um, it's like, dude, it takes a fuck ton of work. I don't think people realize like, you got to be playing the long game with this stuff. Like you might not really get a lot of payoff for it. It might take three, six months for you to get a decent payoff from it. But as soon as someone comes in and is like, dude, I've been following you forever. It's like, you're, you're totally right, man. Those it's, it's almost like most of the sales calls I do now, it feels like cheating. 
this is why I don't do outbound yeah. for myself anymore. If I do, I do outbound to practice. I act like I'm one of my clients because when I call right. people, it's like, yeah, I'm going to call, I'm going to call all the people I'm first degree connections with, which is like, you know, 36,000 yeah. people or whatever it is. I'm going to call all those people. And most of them are going to see this stuff and recognize me. And it's like, that's, that's the type of thing that you can create. You know, if you put time in, I, I listened to gong, I think is such a great example of like just awesome marketing, you know, and I listened to one of the reps mid calls and, you know, one of the questions they always ask at the beginning, which is, you know, I don't, I'm sort of mixed opinions on this question, but have you heard of gong? And what's really funny is a lot of the people that they call in tech have heard of gong. There's immediate credibility mm -hmm. at the beginning of a call. It doesn't feel yeah. so cold, you know? Um, so let's, let's talk like kind of tactically around. Um, so if someone's getting started with this, like if we kind of look at the broad strokes of what you would do. So let's think of like, if I'm just getting started, what should I actually be doing on LinkedIn? So how many times should I be posting? Um, should I be liking comedy? Can you kind of get into some of the tactical things that um, someone might do on a weekly or monthly basis that's getting started with us? Yeah, I think a really good warm up for people that are um, fearful about posting on LinkedIn. And um, I say this because for all of the bravado that sales reps have, um, there's a lot of fear that goes into posting content. Um, and so to help you warm up beyond that is to start leaving comments. Um, make a list of the, the prospects on your list that have active LinkedIn presences. And also at least three to five influencers, meaning somebody who has engagement within the target market you sell into, right? So um, if you sell to um, VPs of marketing, find marketing influencers and also your prospects who themselves post content and leave thoughtful comments, ideally three to five a day at least on those people's posts. Now we have a tool you can use to do this and make it really easy to figure out when they post and get alerted for it. Um, but you can also just look at your feed and make sure you follow those people. You can bookmark them, What's you can do the, whatever you want to get a, an alert. Sorry for interrupting. Don't be afraid to uh, let us know. What's the tool, dude? Cause I want to check it out. I haven't checked out your tool yet. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we haven't, I haven't done the public announcement. The tool is called aware. Oh, okay. And, um, so okay. aware essentially, um, it, it codifies all the stuff that, that I've done to be successful, right? It, it, we figure out who your industry influences are um, who your competitors are, your customers and your prospects. And we tell you when your prospects interact with customers of yours. So you can say, you know, Hey, Acme works with us. You guys should too. Um, we tell you when your, your top prospects engage with your competitors, which tells you a bunch about how to open a call with them. Um, and we actually sync all the stuff to Salesforce. So you can stop, um, telling your manager you're working and you can show them that your social selling activity on LinkedIn is actually working. Um, so I, there are a lot of people who have a, a trimmed down version of that where they just have bookmark bars with the influencers they want to follow and they check it every morning. Oh. Um, so you can use aware to make it really fast um, and see more of this stuff. But, but Hey, like I've done it for years before we, we made aware on my own. I just hit the follow button who I wanted to follow and, you know, took it in my own hands, it took longer. Um, but you know, it, it works just fine if you're getting started. Um, so yeah, leave five comments a day. That's that's a uh, that's a great way to to kick things off if you're just getting going. And then the first post, I think people should write if you're um, if you want to keep it professional and you don't want to tell a story about yourself, is tell a case study. Um, look at the last three deals you closed, and then um, pick the one that had the best post implementation success, and tell the high level story of how how they got to you, what they cared most about what you changed their mind about, how the signup process went, and then what they achieved after implementing your product. Touch on it, broad brush strokes. Leave information out uh, so that people will wonder about the details and contact you to get those details. You do not have to name the customer. So warm up routine, kind of like you're going to the gym, right? Your warm up routine for social selling is leave three to five comments a day on your prospects content and influencers content. And then your first set is to post one customer story in call it 1500 characters, like 300 words, max, keep it short, give credit to your team, give credit to the customer. 
um, take all the credit off yourself. Just try that and see how it goes. Uh, if you do those things, having not done them before and you don't see meaningful uptick in engagement on your content and engagement with prospects, I will be a monkey's uncle because that is basically the recipe to get noticed. Um, how, how could it not work, right? If you're leaving a thoughtful comment on you know, posts that matter and get seen by prospects, mm -hmm. how could that not generate awareness for you, your name, your face, your company, how would it not increase your open rates and your, your like you said with Gong, the cold call rates? Um, how much easier is it for Gongsters to cold call because everyone knows their brain and they've been on social forever than it is for, you know, unnamed tech company XYZ, right? Um, yep. A lot of people just, they don't believe that it works. And I'm like, until you've seen it, it's hard to, but think about almost how could it not work? Um, you're getting in front of people in the right way at the right time. They're going to see it. It's going to have an effect. So that's the warm yeah. routine and that's how to actually go and finally start. So once you start, I don't, now I'm not a, necessarily a fan of the every day for everyone because that's a lot of time investment. Um, I think yep. that'd be really good to do. And I want to increase my, well, wealth, especially for a, but hell, I'm, for a salesperson too, you know, because like we're both business owners, you know what I mean? And like my yeah. business relies on inbound as a lead generation tool. It's where I get all of almost all of my business right. from, you know? So I'm, I'm glad you sort of shared that, that detail. You don't need to post every day <laughs> like a maniac. <laughs> yeah. I post one point. I was posting 1.3 times a week, um, on average. And recently I've been mm -hmm. posting 1.7 times a week. So I'm slowly making it up to twice a week velocity, but hell, I mean, if I've clocked in 3.4 million in sales for my LinkedIn posts in the last few years mm -hmm. from posting, not even twice a week, like what could you do with an extra 3.4 million in sales in the next few years? I mean, yeah. From posting once or twice a week. I mean, people do way better than that too. I mean, if your deal size is three times mine, which it often is for a tech company, you're going to do better than me. So, you know, there's no reason you shouldn't be making 10 million plus from this strategy in, in five years if you're doing it right. And if you have a big enough deal size. So if you sell widgets worth 2000 a year, like, well, maybe this is not the strategy for you. Right. But um, uh, if, you, yeah. if you're in B2B, if you're mid-market or enterprise, a hundred percent do this and Take it easy if you want. You don't have to go hog wild and post every day unless you want to. And if you do, hats off to you. So let me, I want to ask you about, and one thing I want to point out, the the strategy, step number one is like, it's a strategy of giving. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that's super important. It's like the strategy, like if you want people to be more attracted to what you're doing, like you need to put some love out there in the <laughs> in, in into some other people's yeah. posts, you know? Um, so you said leave comments. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like, this isn't just a like and a cool post submit yeah. comment. Like it's a meaningful comment. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, it, what I want people to do is take your sales hat off. So let's say somebody in your network um, who has either their prospect or they have influence with your prospects and they're hiring somebody. Um, and they post about it, leave a comment that says, Hey, I'm, this is awesome. Really good role bumping for my network. I'm going to DM you with a couple of candidates and then DM them with some names they can follow up with. Like you added a ton of value just by making a connection in your network. Um, so that's, that's, it's nothing like, you know, congratulations, cool post. It's like actually do something right. Um, if somebody, Again, in your network, this is this is not like your buddy. This is like somebody who is in your industry publishes something that that um, takes a stand on an issue, right? Maybe it's a CISO who um, takes a stand on how sales reps should be reaching out to CISOs, and you leave a one paragraph thoughtful, nuanced response that has nothing to do with your product. You're gonna get noticed. So, like, take your sales hat off and literally just respond as a person, a professional person, but as a person. Um, you do not need to, nor should you, be talking about your company or your product most of the time because it's on your profile. They're going to go to your profile if they're interested and they'll see who you work for. Um, yeah. Your goal with commenting is just to be in a normal conversation that happens to be occurring on LinkedIn.com instead of in real life. But it should be as close to a real life conversation at a trade show, for example, or anywhere else 
as it can possibly be. So don't be a weirdo. Don't be overly professional and formal. Um, don't be neurotic and awkward if you are not neurotic and awkward in real life. Just be yourself and have a conversation. And if you don't know what to say because you're so new in your industry that you don't actually have any product knowledge yet or industry knowledge, don't do this strategy. <laughs> wait, wait till you have some knowledge to share, right? But then when you do, share it. Um, so with the commenting behavior, it's less of like, great post, congratulations, you know, spot on. That's, that's something you can say to anybody. And you're not telling anybody you pay attention to them. So another way of saying this is make people feel listened to. Yeah. If you really listened to their post and heard it and reacted with something that was your own reaction that could not be copied and pasted, that's just a life skill. That's a conversational skill that you should have from being a human being. So I hopefully I'm not teaching you anything new. It's mostly just like, hey, do the thing where you listen and actually react genuinely. But don't pretend like you have to prospect or pump your company. So just get rid of that impulse. Take your sales head off. React normally and authentically. Um, and put some effort into it. Like spend 30 seconds instead of five seconds writing a thoughtful response. Um, so in my course, I talk about slowing down your interactions. That's what I mean. Like don't just pitch all the time to try to get to a meeting as fast as possible. It's okay to just take it easy and leave a normal comment on an executive's post because you thought it was interesting. It doesn't have to go anywhere, you know, that you can put a dollar sign on. It really shouldn't. You shouldn't try to put a dollar sign in every interaction. Um, so just have normal conversations. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, I think this is tough for a lot of people because they want results fast, especially salespeople, right? Because they want to get meetings yeah. and um, God, this is definitely like, you got to think of it like a pipeline, you know, that you're building, like you're creating a lot of awareness and like, do mm -hmm. you like to kind of talk about the posts, do you mix in, you know, posts that are kind of give oriented where like, Hey, I'm sharing this case study. Like, do you make a call to action at all in some of the posts? Like, Hey, if you're interested in getting help, like how we help them reach out to me kind of thing. Do you do any of that kind of stuff in the content that you post? How do you, how do you think about the call to action, I guess, in these posts and what you want people yeah. to do? That's a good question. I think a lot of people put too many calls to action because they almost like insult their buyer's intelligence by putting it there. Um, the, here's the main thing I do. So I will post maybe like once or twice a week. And for three weeks, I'll post nothing but gives, right? Perspective, insights, how to's, case studies, or actually not case studies. And then, you know, after a few weeks, I'll just post like this, you know, smash hit case study of like customer just signed on six months ago. And then six months in, here are the results. Hats off to our team, did a great job. You know, I'll put an image showing their keyword growth, their traffic growth, and their leads growth or their conversion rate growth, some, something, something stat, right? Like an image um, with the, the labels taken off. And, and then I'll get three leads all at once, right? Um, but I don't need to put a CTA. Here's why. People see the company you work for. They see the case study. They've read what you put out there. They know that you're in sales and they can contact mm -hmm. you if they want to do something with you, right? Like you don't have to beat them over head and be like, hi, I am in sales. Please contact me if you want to do that. Like, they get it, you know, yeah. just... Just put it out there and be a friendly person. Um, the best thing you can do rather than putting a CTA out there um, is to not because people feel safer. Um, Josh Brown put this in a really funny way where he said, don't chase cats. Um, if you have not pet a cat recently, think about how to do it. You don't run up to the cat with your hand outstretched. It's going to run. You go and sit by it and maybe offer your hand and let it come to you because it feels yeah. safe. And that, interestingly, is how an enterprise buyer thinks. If it, if they think this is a sales bot who, if I message them, they're just going to try to take my money in five seconds, that's not a good use of my time. If they think yeah. this is a real person who could discuss something with me before they take my money, they will feel much safer reaching out to you. So by making people feel safer, what you do by slowing down, you encourage more people to reach out to you. If you only pitch everyone all the time, you're going to turn everyone off. So that's how slowing down actually leads to more results. Got it. Do you, is in, there any part of this strategy that's, hey, I'm leaving comments, I'm posting stuff that's proactively DMing? 
you know, your prospects. Yeah. Yeah. If you have something to say, that's like I mentioned in the first example, if somebody is hiring and you know, some folks, you'd be like, Hey, I saw your post. You should reach out to these two people. I think they'd be receptive. Just say that. Um, mm -hmm. Normal people, when they interact with each other and keep in touch, they don't pitch each other all the time. They don't have an agenda. They just say things that are useful. Um, yeah. If somebody says something and you have a genuine tip to leave, do so, especially if it's like better explained in the DMs. So if someone's like, hey, you know, we're having this, this issue. Does anyone have any recommendations for, you know, how to track whatever, whatever. And then you DM them and be like, hey, I saw your post. Um, we had somebody go through this too. They actually implemented this, this, and this. I'm not sure if it worked for you, but if you want, I can put you in touch. Or like, here's an article about how they did that. It should not be a veiled sales pitch. Just like literally just help people with stuff that you know how to do. Like you said, you talk to 60 principals a year. They talk to three people a year, something like that, right? You probably know a good amount about how to help principals run um, school districts or schools better. Um, and a lot of that I bet is not necessarily involving your product. So you can just DM them with helpful tips, advice, or you can even yeah. just react thoughtfully in private to their post. Like if they wrote a really thoughtful post, send them a message that explains why you identify with it. It could be personal. It could be like, Hey, I went through the same thing you're going through, um, a while back. Um, it could be, you know, something about, I mean, uh, who was it at Gong? I think it's the CMO of Gong post him playing the piano. If you also play the piano, just send them something with the piano. I don't, but you, see what I mean? Just like send them anything. Just talk to people. Yeah. Um, and then they will gather from that, that you are a real person. They will see your profile, what your yeah. product is and does. And if they see your case studies, they'll be like, okay. Yeah. When they trust you and can talk to you, they'll ask you for help with whatever it is your product mm -hmm. does. So lastly, at some point, is it okay to ask to meet? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When is if that point? Have when, a, do, when do you know it's good to ask? I think you can, you can always make an ask if you want. It's going mm -hmm. to go better if you have spent some time building things up. Um, your, your best bet for making an, an ask as early as possible is to reference something that is an actual meaningful connection. So if they post something that, um, isn't just a lame excuse for you to pitch, right? But it's like they posted about, um, so maybe they posted about having a four day work week. Um, and you made the connection between them prioritizing the mental health of their folks and your product in some way. Um, in my industry, it could be somebody who is, you know, um, launching a new site and they just launched it. And I noticed it's riddled with SEO issues. I might be like, hey, I'm not trying to read on the parade or anything. I created a video for you on some things that you might want to do with your new site. Congrats on the launch. It looks great. But my video below points out some stuff that might be helpful that you can take action on. If it makes sense to me, happy to do a 30 minute call to unpack it further. Um, so whatever it is, you have the most success by connecting it to something that is going on in their world. Um, yeah. You'll have the least success by pasting your cold call script and putting into LinkedIn. That is not social selling. You can do it, but it's not social selling. And the conversion rate will be the normal, you know, one to 2% maybe versus a social selling conversion rate of like 50%. Literally, like if, if you do this right, you can have 40% conversion rates or 50 or plus uh, on your um, true social selling interactions. So um, try to reserve your pitches for those situations rather than just pitching over LinkedIn. If you wanna go in the middle ground of that and like the gray area, you can open with pitching based on something that is going on in their world that you can actually thoughtfully connect to your product. Um, a lame connection would be, Jason, I saw you on LinkedIn, you just got a dog. Do you wanna hire us for SEO? Like there's no connection. That doesn't, that doesn't have anything to do with each other, right? Like, um, and yeah. rarely will you get so close a connection where they are like, I saw you posted about hiring an SEO agency. We are an SEO agency. Like that's almost, that's never going to happen. It's too close. You're almost always going to have like a connection that you need to make an inference from. Like mm -hmm. they just announced that they're getting SOC 2 certified. Um, but you notice something about the way that they architected their team or their site that might present an issue and your product can help with that. So you might send something that's like, hey, 
Notice you're in the process of getting SOC 2. Have you considered this? How are you going to take care of this issue? If you're curious, I can unpack more how this uh, product that we have helps with it, right? Most of the, your pitches from social will be of that variety, where it's like, saw this update, not trying to rush you, but here's some helpful tips. Um, some variant of that, right? Whatever your industry is. Got it. Love it, dude. We're about out of time. I got two quick uh, rapid fire questions for you. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, what is something that you believe about sales that most would disagree with? Mm. Um, it's funny because most in my circle, I have to think of what most people, in, including not my circle, would disagree with. Um, I think that it's more about enjoying the job than it is about the money. Um, if I just wanted to maximize dollars, I would be doing something else. Um, but I'm doing a, a version of sales that I enjoy, even though it is not the maximal use of my time to correlate to cash in my bank now. Um, and I believe that is the only real way to maintain and have robust mental and physical health and financial health while doing this in the long term. Um, I think a lot of salespeople do it because it, if you do certain things, no matter how you feel about it, no matter how much fun you have or don't have, you can maximize dollars with this profession. But that's just not the train that I'm on. So maybe that's something. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give yourself as a rookie sales professional? Say no earlier and more often. Number one oh. is stop taking on the right, the wrong clients, raise your prices, <laughs> raise your prices uh, far earlier than you think you, you should. Um, uh, say no to the wrong people, tell people um, right up front if it's even an iffy fit and tell them why it's an iffy fit. Bad fits, just say no. Iffy fits, tell them a tell them hundred reasons why it won't work um, rather than before you tell a single reason why it will. Let people really self-select to work with you and you'll build immense credibility and trust. I think I was a little too yes heavy early in my career where I was like, yeah, we can get that done. And I would bust ass to make it work. And it was a huge waste of time rather than like really filtering hard for the people that were going to be easy buyers with large checks. Um, say no early and often point out risks more than you point on opportunities. Um, and I would have, I would be in a much different position today if I had done that five years ago more often. Dude, I love that. And before you take off, uh, if you're still listening, make sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to it so you can get notified next time an episode like this comes out. Alex, this was great. Before you take off, where's the best place for people to connect with you? I know you got a course that you just came out with. Where can, where can people go to get info on that? Yeah, go to my LinkedIn profile. Uh, find me, Alex Boyd at Revenue Zen. Uh, if you want to learn more about what I talked about, I do have a two-hour course, chock full of the good stuff. It's on my profile. Or just shoot me a DM and say hi. And um, especially if questions about anything I mentioned here, uh, my DMs are always open.